Indian Lake. It's 8 o'clock. Good morning. This is Northern Light for Wednesday, August 2nd. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. Pharmaceutical company Sterex plans to close its Plattsburgh facilities, affecting more than 150 jobs. But plans are underway to find a buyer. Also on the show, Clarkson University is offering free entrepreneurship classes in Malone, Potsdam, Saranac Lake, and Lowville. They're focused on basic business financial skills for business owners. They may have the greatest product in the world, But if you're not doing a good job balancing your books, understanding where you are in your financial position, scheduling your payments, those types of things are critically important. And they're the reason that a lot of businesses fail. Chef Curtis shares a recipe for a favorite vegetarian dish that's a good candidate for summer grilling. You know, my summer progresses. I'm more and more interested in vegetables and plants than I am in meat. He considers cauliflower as the chicken breast of vegetable world, a sort of blank canvas upon which to add rich flavors. Will you hear his recipe? And all of that and more is coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by you, our listeners. Make a gift right now at ncpr.org slash give. Partly sunny skies today, highs this afternoon in the upper 60s, low 70s, light winds out of the south. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. The pharmaceutical company Sterex is closing its two Plattsburgh facilities, affecting more than 150 jobs. But efforts are underway to find a buyer. Our Champlain Valley reporter, Kara Chapman, has more. Sterex filed a notice announcing the upcoming closure of its Plattsburgh plants with the State Department of Labor late last month. My NBC5 first reported the news Tuesday. According to the DOL notice, Sterex employs 161 people at its two locations on the former Plattsburgh Air Force Base property. October 24th is listed as the layoff date. Director of Plant Operations Sarah McCoy said in a statement that Sterex has ceased operations in Plattsburgh and will close the sites pending divestiture. She says all employees will continue to receive full compensation and benefits and until late October, followed by severance pay. According to North Country Chamber of Commerce President Gary Douglas, Sterex's parent company was recently acquired by a global company that is focusing on other lines of business. Douglas says the chamber is working with Sterex to hopefully find a buyer. If that doesn't happen in the near term, he says the DOL and North Country Workforce Development Board are working on a plan to assist and support employees. He says, quote, every effort we can make to ideally preserve employment at the site will be made. The news of Sterex's upcoming closure comes just weeks after Novabus announced plans to close its Plattsburgh facility in 2025 and move bus production to Quebec. Novabus employs about 350 people. Local officials hope to find a buyer for that plant as well. Kara Chapman, North Country Public Radio. New York State has its work cut out to meet the clean energy goals of its defining climate legislation. That's according to the state controller. A report from Democrat Tom DiNapoli finds that renewable generators in New York would need to produce an additional 78,000 gigawatt hours above 2022 levels. That's an increase of more than 200 percent in order to reach 70 percent renewable electricity consumption by 2030, as set up by the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. The analysis is based on projections from the New York Independent System Operator. NYISO has also projected that the state would need to add 20 gigawatts of renewable capacity by 2030, triple the 2022 capacity. The Napoli says the transmission capacity for connecting upstate regions to New York City is limited and renewable facilities upstate are already being forced to curb generation due to transmission constraints. As of last year, about 29% of the electricity generated in New York came from renewable sources. The top Democrat in the state assembly is throwing cold water on a report this week that says lawmakers are preparing for a return to Albany for a special session this fall. Speaker Carl Hasty of the Bronx was asked about the possibility during a visit to Philmont in Columbia County yesterday. Um, no, 
I, I, I think at this point, um, listen, it's only July. Can things change? But uh, there's August. been no. Oh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. August first. Um, it's uh, we haven't had any discussions about coming back. The report said the focus would be a new gaming agreement with the Seneca Nation, an issue that wasn't completed when lawmakers ended their session in June. A bill that would require private health insurance and Medicaid to pay for biomarker testing for cancer patients will soon be sent to Governor Kathy Hochul's desk. Karen DeWitt met with a 10-year-old cancer survivor who may be the bill's most effective lobbyist. Dear Governor Hochul, my name is Charlotte Carlin. I'm 10 years old, almost 11. Charlotte Carlin was diagnosed with brain cancer when she was four years old. She underwent a nine-hour operation. She's healthy now and about to enter sixth grade. Hey, how are you? Hottest day of the year, right? I visited Charlotte and her mother, Mary Carlin, on a steamy summer morning at their home in a capital region suburb. Their small black dog, Betsy, enthusiastically greeted us. You're going to stay with the show. (laughs) Charlotte says she doesn't remember much about her illness. She'd rather talk about her favorite video games and her plans to become an astronaut when she grows up. She says she's already planning to go to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University when she's a bit older. And I'm going to get an engineering degree so I can become an astronaut and I might like maybe go to flight school or something. But she does want people to know at least one thing about her experience. She even included it in the recent handwritten letter to Governor Hochul. Biomarker testing saves lives. Biomarkers are puzzle pieces. Charlotte benefited from biomarker testing, which involves testing blood or tissue for the presence of certain genes or biomarkers. With that knowledge, doctors can target a patient's treatment to better manage their illness and often provide better outcomes. In Charlotte's case, the testing found that she had a certain gene. If some small pieces of the original tumor that remain in her brain were to reactivate, the test results make her eligible for a drug which targets the exact type of tumor and inhibits it from growing. Biomarker testing also helped her mother. She's a cancer survivor, too. In Mary Carlin's case, testing done in 2015 identified a tumor in her breast as one fueled by estrogen. As a result, she's able to take a pill that inhibits estrogen production throughout her body to help prevent the cancer from ever returning. She also chose a double mastectomy as part of her treatment. Mary later found, again through biomarker testing, that she has the BRCA2 gene and that she's more susceptible to ovarian cancer. One of her great aunts died of the illness before the age of 50. The information from the two tests convinced her to have her ovaries removed as well. Number one, I knew I had a high risk of ovarian cancer, but also the the information that estrogen was driving those tumors, it made the most sense to me to just you know, try to eliminate the estrogen as much as possible. Mary Carlin says she and Charlotte are fortunate that they had health insurance plans that paid for their testing, but others don't have that option. And she says it's important that people have that coverage at a time when there have been many medical advances for targeted cancer drugs. Medical innovation is outpacing what insurance companies will cover. So something may be readily available for a patient, a cancer patient, but they may not financially be able to access it. And I think that's awful. Mary and Charlotte have been to the state capitol several times this year to advocate for the bill that would require private health insurance and Medicaid to pay for the biomarker testing. The Carlins met with lawmakers and their staffs and spoke at news conferences. The measure passed both houses unanimously in the state senate. Charlotte has one last person to convince, Governor Hochul. I hope you sign S1196A. Hochul does not like to say in advance whether she will sign a piece of legislation. Her office will only say that the bill has not yet reached her desk. Thank you so much for reading this. Sincerely, Charlotte. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt. You're listening.
listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It's 10 minutes past 8. Good morning. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandresky. Just ahead, a grilled cauliflower is a great alternative to steak. Chef Curtis Hem tells us why and how coming up in a few minutes here on Northern Light. This is David Archibald out of Kingston, Ontario. Check out more of his music anytime. He's part of the Underscore Project, and you'll find more at ncpr.org slash underscore. Northern Light is supported by Mountain Orthotic and Prosthetic Services, a full-service practice committed to providing care for patients of all ages, with offices in Lake Placid, Plattsburgh, and Malone. Details and referrals at mountainonp.com. And by Blue Seed Studio, Saranac Lake, promoting community involvement in the arts. On the web at bluseedstudios.org. For the last six years, Clarkson University's Shipley Center for Innovation has been bringing its business expertise to entrepreneurs across the North Country. Free workshops from Ticonderoga to Carthage to Ogdensburg teach practical skills to start or grow a business. They're part class, part networking mixer. This summer's workshops are in Potsdam, Saranac Lake, Lowville, and tonight in Malone. Director Jamie Hoos told David Summerstein the focus this year is on basic business financial financial skills. I think what we find in our world is that a lot of people uh, that want to start a business, to own a business, are rightfully very focused on the product that they're delivering. Um, But what they need to understand is that they may have the greatest product in the world, but if you're not doing a good job balancing your books, understanding where you are in your financial position, scheduling your payments, those types of things are critically important. And they're the reason that a lot of businesses fail. So we want companies, we want entrepreneurs, we want small businesses to continue focusing on that core product, make it an excellent product, uh, make their customers very, very happy, but also understand the implication of the bottom line, understand what a balance sheet is, what a cash flow statement is, understand the tools that you can use to help manage your finances, understand the problems that can be created when you don't manage your finances well. That will be a big part of this is case studies of, of why we think it's so important for people to have better financial uh, awareness of, of what their business is doing. You've been doing this for six years, you know, like you said, different focuses in different years. Uh, but, uh, you know, what have, what's been the results? What's been the impact of, you know, going out into the community and bringing business and entrepreneurship training to people? I mean, has it created more businesses? What do we know? Uh, I think in a lot of cases, there has been new businesses. And I, and I don't have a, a precise data to, to share with you today. But what we're finding is that it's giving people more confidence. And it's also letting people know of the resources. One of the big pivots that we've done in the last couple of years is we've partnered with our local resources, the Chambers of Commerce, the Industrial Development Agencies, the um, uh, you, you know the other universities in our region, and we've we've tried to make them aware of this, and we bring them to these events so that when our when we have participants there, they're not only learning about the particular uh, curriculum that we have for that program, but they're also learning about the wealth of other resources that our region has, and I think it's that piece that really helps people move forward in terms of what to bring. Uh, just you know, bring questions. Uh, bring a uh, a positive attitude that you're going to come and you're going to talk about the, uh, the the struggles that you may be facing amongst your peers and amongst some uh, amongst some subject matter experts and and hopefully you leave with a lot more confidence uh, and a lot more resources at your fingertips. Explain just briefly why like why is it important? You know you have a uh, great facilities at Clarkson. There's other universities that have. Why are you bringing all of this stuff out to people where they are? The reason that we want to be in communities around the North Country is is that we don't believe that every business uh, 
needs to be in in one location. And and we don't we want to be able to set the standard that if you have a successful business or a great business idea that's going to be working in, in Ticonderoga or in Tupper Lake or Long Lake or in Malone, we want to support you where you're at. We want your businesses to thrive in your home community uh, because if all of our home communities have thriving small businesses and, and industry and, and hopefully startup companies, then we're all going to be better as a seven county North Country community. And, and that's what we're after. We're not after making Potsdam a, a, a business powerhouse. We're after making the entire North Country a fun, uh, safe and, and really economically vibrant place to live. And, and we believe that by going into these communities and supporting people in those communities, that's the best way to do it. Great. Well, anything else you feel like is important to add? thing that uh, you talk about the experience. Uh, this is, it's an evening event. It's meant to be fun. Uh, there's going to be uh, drinks and a bite to eat. And uh, it is, you know, it, it's not meant to be a networking event, but there's going to be a chance to meet other great people there and uh, and really get a chance for one-on-one help as well to kind of talk through, mm-hmm. you know, meet people where they're at and help them with whatever their situation is for their business. Jamie Hoos directs the Shipley Center for Innovation at Clarkson University. He spoke with David Summerstein. The free workshop in Malone is tonight, then August 16th in Saranac Lake, September 6th in Potsdam, and September 13th in Lowville. You can find a link to register by going to our website, ncpr.org. Listening to Northern Lights here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. In just a minute, vegetables take the spotlight in this month's recipe from Chef Curtis. That's coming up in just a minute. Then stick around after the show for Bird Note. Elderberries, blackberries, dogwood berries, mulberries, and currants are all irresistible to many types of birds. Plants offer their bounty in exchange, though, for birds' help in distributing their seeds. We'll hear more about that coming. Coming up at 842, but first, Todd has a look at the weather for us. Partly cloudy skies for much of the region today. Highs in the uh, ranging room of the upper 60s into the mid-70s. Cooler spots in the Adirondacks. Lows tonight uh, in the 50s, low 60s, uh, partly cloudy overnight. And then increasing clouds and about a 50-50 chance of showers tomorrow. Mid-70s for highs again on Thursday. Friday, an 80% chance of rain with highs, low 70s. And at this point for the weekend, uh, partly sunny skies Saturday and Sunday with highs in the low to mid 70s. Chef Curtis Hem thinks of cauliflower as the chicken breast of the vegetable world, a sort of blank canvas upon which to add rich flavors. Since it takes aggressive heat well, he finds it's a good candidate for summer grilling. Curtis Hem knows a lot about food. Every month, he brings us a seasonal recipe. He owns the Carriage House Cooking School in Peru, New York, and is the executive chef at the View Restaurant at the Mirror Lake Inn Resort and Spa in Lake Placid. And Chef Curtis told our Todd Moe that carrots and broccoli are also good candidates for expanding a carnivore's grilling repertoire. I guess I just picked it because cauliflower is coming up soon Uh and we usually have a lot of herbs on hand as well. So I I wanted to make the herb vinaigrette and then the cauliflower was just a perfect use of a vegetable and people might not think of actually grilling cauliflower. And if you don't have cauliflower, broccoli works wonderful or eggplant works wonderful. So it was really just more plant-based foods as you know, my summer progresses. I'm more and more interested in vegetables and plants than I am in meat. So if you've got cauliflower out in the garden or you find it at the farmer's market, here's an idea, right? Yeah, it's a great use of it. And, you know, the original concept of this came from somebody who needed to get away from red meat. That was how the dish was designed. But it's, you know, pretty much for anybody that likes vegetables. And it's a great use. You could do this as a side vegetable, too. Let's start with the uh, the vinaigrette. Um, which is kind of a combination of oil and lemon juice and some herbs. Yeah, there's no fencing agent in here. This is just a straight-up herb oil. And I have basil, chives, and parsley because that's usually what I have on hand. But someone may have oregano, chive, and 
rosemary is going to work just fine. Um, oregano is an absolutely underappreciated herb, and it grows very well here and has a beautiful flower for a garnish as well. I like oregano a lot. We use, a, we use oregano at the end, and we use it here at the carriage house quite a bit. It's whatever you have on hand. You know, parsley is a great economical choice. I know North Point Community Farm has some amazing uh, herbs, and most people have some form of an herb pot in their backyard somewhere. So, uh, and then you just use olive oil. You can use extra virgin if you want, but I don't call for it here. I want something a little bit lighter. Mm -hmm. And some lemon juice, fresh squeezed, two tablespoons is about half a lemon. And um, you want to pick a round, non-pointed lemon that has smooth skin. That's a good juicing lemon. Little chef tip there. Uh huh. So basically, we put all of those things, the basil, the, well, the herbs, the oil, and the lemon juice, and we put it in a blender. Or if you have a little immersion blender, you can put it in just a little mason jar and puree it until it's as smooth as you want. Then the but, walnuts, uh, the walnuts uh, are, are something you can prepare while you're waiting for the, the grill to heat up? Yeah, and you can do it while the steak is cooking. Cause uh -huh. I, I like to toast the walnuts. It brings out a little bit of flavor in them loosens up whatever papery husk is there a little bit, but it really allows the fat and the walnut to come alive. Um, and I, I really resisted the temptation to put the walnuts in the herb mixture, which would have been kind of, I'm using air quotes here, pesto-ish. Mm -hmm. um, because I wanted, the, I wanted the contrast and the real kind of bite of a, of a walnut with this dish. What do you look for in terms of picking the right cauliflower for this? <laughs> really tight. <laughs> A really, really tight head, huh. and I don't want to see the florets loose, so I don't want it to be overgrown. I want it to have a really compact size, and I want it to be very firm and not giving at all. That's that's pretty much what I'm looking for. Color as well. I'm not looking for anything with a yellow tint to it. I'm really looking for a bright white cauliflower head with really good... If you're at the farmer's market, they're probably going to have the leaves on it. Mm -hmm. Um and you want to check those leaves for vibrancy. You want those leaves to be full of moisture and, and firm as well. In a head of cauliflower, there's enough for two really good-sized cauliflower steaks in mm -hmm. the center. So if we're going to use some butchery terms, we're going to call those, and again, air quotes here, center-cut prime cauliflower steaks. And then, and I'm smiling the whole time I'm telling you this, right? <laughs> so, so then you have your two ends, and those are those are also good to grill, but they're going to fall apart a little bit. Yeah. And... And so we call those the, air quotes, turnados of cauliflower. Um, you can use it all. It's a 100%, you know, fine product. It's just the, the steak has this massive presence on the center of a plate. Are you talking like about a half inch thick steak? Three quarters. Depends okay. on the head of cauliflower. Some yeah. cauliflower heads are small and you may only get one steak out of it. Some mm -hmm. are really large um, and you'll get two, you know, three quarter to a one inch steaks. The thicker, the better, in my opinion. And what does grilling the cauliflower do? Does it is it kind of um, charred on the outside and then tender on the inside? Is that the idea? Yeah. So there is you know there is sugar involved in cauliflower, and caramelization occurs, and you really a couple different things. You're not penetrating the cauliflower with a moisture. You're actually you know the application of heat is hydrolysis. So you're actually removing moisture from the cauliflower via steaming, and it. It softens the texture up a little bit, but it's still going to leave it pretty firm, which is what we want for this dish. It provides that wonderful charred flavor. Um, and actually, you know, cauliflower and broccoli, this is my favorite way to cook them. I just, whether it's in a pan and I'm just caramelizing them or on a grill and I'm charring them, I just love that contrast of flavor and the texture of it because it's still got a toothsome bite to it. It has this amazing depth of flavor where it's 100% cauliflower. But it's also got some grill on it. And you're kind of like, wait a second. And if you're blindfolded, I don't know if you necessarily know exactly what you're eating. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the season to do this, as you mentioned, uh, Curtis, with the cauliflower uh, coming into its own and, you know, kind of the high season for farmer's markets. So uh, great idea to pick up some herbs, pick up the, the cauliflower. Yeah. And this, you know, again, I, you know, I said it earlier, but... If you have a lot of zucchini, this is a great application for zucchini. And if I was going to do zucchini, I might want to crumble some Parmesan cheese on top. You'd get a real good Italian feel out of that. But again, you could use broccolini if you had broccolini. Mm -hmm. If you had a lot of eggplant, you could do that. Even just grilling green beans and doing the sauce and the walnuts with that is a fantastic dish. With the zucchini, would you slice it in you know slabs rather than rounds? I would just do it in half lengthwise. Yeah. And, uh, 
just kind of oil that and brush it with oil and put it on a really hot grill and let it char. And I wouldn't even cook the second side. I took almost all the way through one side, almost similar to a la plancha. Yeah. Oh, but so carrots work well. You know, I know carrots are coming on the market pretty good. Anything that can hold to the grill, you know, and allows you to turn it once is a really good candidate for this this methodology. Chef Curtis Hem brings us a seasonal recipe each month. He owns the Carriage House Cooking School in Peru, New York, and is the executive chef at the View Restaurant at the Mira Lake Inn Resort and Spa in Lake Placid. Music now by the group High and Mighty Brass Band. This Brooklyn-based brass ensemble has performed plenty of times in the North Country, and they are back from Music on the Green at Riverside Park and Saranac Lake tonight. Show starts at 7. This is their song, No Diggity. Strictly bitch, she don't play around. High and Mighty Brass Band. See them tonight in Saranac Lake at Riverside Park as part of the Music on the Green uh, Summer Concert Series. The show starts at 7 o'clock and should run until about 9. That is it for the show for the day. Morning Edition continues in just a couple of minutes. Then don't forget to stick around after that for the Marketplace Morning Report coming up between 8.51 and 9 o'clock. Also, as a reminder, NCPR's North Country at Work Project is coming to Clayton. Join our team this Saturday to share your piece of the North Country's work history. We'll be at the Antique Boat Show all day scanning photos and recording your work stories that Saturday, August 5th from 10 to 4 at the Antique Boat Show in Clayton. Get details at ncpr.org slash calendar. 
Catch Dan Duggan and Peggy Lynn. They're going to be giving a concert tonight, 7 o'clock at Big Moose Chapel. And you can join them on Friday night, actually, Jam Crackers at Cafe Lena in Saratoga Springs. Cafe Lena, Friday night, 8 o'clock. Thanks for listening. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Be well.